cost a mint of money, says he. He could end up in Siberia for that, if I'd a mind. That sacrilege, that is. Hey, you, Scarecrow. He addressed the official. What's the law on that? Is it sacrilege or not? Oh, yes, sacrilege, assented the official at once. You get Siberia for that? Oh, yes, Siberia. Siberia straight away. They still think I'm ill. Prigozhin went on to the prince. But I sneaked into this carriage in a way. Better or not. And no word to anybody. Open up the gates, dear brother Simeon Simeonich. He slandered me to my father, rest his soul. That's something I do know. Still, it's the truth. I did annoy the old man over Nastasia Filipovna. That was all my fault. Led into temptation. Over Nastasia Filipovna, mumbled the obsequious official, as if something was dawning on him. You don't know her, do you? Rogozhin shouted at him, exasperated. Indeed I do, replied the official triumphantly. Oh, really? There's plenty Nastasia Filipovnas in this world. And you're an impudent creature, I may say. There you are. I knew some creature like this would fasten on to me before I could turn round, he continued, addressing the prince. Perhaps I do know her, sir, for all that. The official was much agitated. Lebedev, no. You, your highness, are pleased to speak harshly, but what if I can prove my words? Is it not that same Nastasia Filipovna who caused you to be chastised with a hazel rod by your father? Her surname's Barashkova. She's a lady of quality, so to speak, also a princess of some kind, and she associates exclusively with a certain Totsky, Afanasy Ivanovich, a very wealthy landowner, director of various companies, and a great friend of General Yepanchi on that account. Oh, so that's your game, is it? Rogoshin was at last genuinely surprised. Well, damnation, he really does know. Everything. Lebedev knows everything. Your Highness, I spent two months going about with Alex Lichatshov after his father died as well, so I know it all, all the ins and outs. It got so that he wouldn't stir a step without Lebedev. Nowadays, he's in the debtor's prison, but at that time, I had the opportunity of getting to know Armands and Coralie and Princess Patskaya and Nastasia Filipovna, too, and got to know a good many other things besides. Nastasia Filipovna? You don't mean Lichachov and her. Rogozhin stared grimly at him with pale and tremulous lips. N not at all. N nothing. Nothing as I live. The official recollected himself and hurried on. I mean, no amount of money could get Lichachov what he wanted. Not like Armand's. It was just Totsky. He's the only one. Well, she used to sit in her own box at the Bolshoi or the French theatre. There's plenty of talk among the officers there, but even they can't prove anything. There she is. That's the famous Nastasia Filipovna. And that's about it. As for anything beyond that, nothing. Because there isn't anything. That's just how it is. Confirmed Rogozhin, scowling morosely. Zalyoshev used to tell me the same thing at the time. I was running across Nevsky Prospect, Prince, wearing my father's three-year-old fur jacket, just as she was coming out of a shop and getting into her carriage. I went hot all over. Then I come across Zalyoshev. He's nothing like me. He goes round looking like a barber's assistant with a monocle in his eye, while we live it up at my old man's in our dubbined boots, eating cabbage soup without meat. She's not on your level, says he. She's a princess, says he. Her name's Nastasia Filipovna, surname Barashkova, and she lives with Totsky. He doesn't know how to get rid of her, because he's reached a good age now, 55, and he wants to get married to the most ravishing beauty in Petersburg. Then he gave me the idea that I could see Nastasia Filipovna that very day at the Bolshoi Ballet, sitting in her own box at the side of the stalls. Just try and get out of my old man's house to go to the ballet. I'd catch it for certain. He'd kill me. Still, I did sneak out on the quiet for an hour and saw Nastasia Filipovna again. 
I didn't sleep a wink that night. In the morning, the old man, God rest him, gives me two 5% bonds, 5,000 each. Sell them, says he, and take 7,500 to Andreev's office, pay it over, and bring what's left straight back to me, no dilly-dallying. I'll be waiting for you. Well, I sold the bonds, but I didn't go near Andreev's. I went straight to the English shop and chose a pair of earrings with a sweet little diamond the size of a knot in each one. I was 400 short, but they trusted me when I gave them my name. Over to Zalyozhev's with the earrings, out with the story, and let's away, friend, to Nastasia Filipovna's. We set off. I haven't the slightest recollection of where I walked, what was in front of me or to either side. We went straight into her entrance hall, and she came out to us herself. At the time, I didn't let on it was me. From Parfion Rogozhin, says Zalyozhev, to mark his meeting with you yesterday, please deign to accept this. She unwrapped it, peeped inside, and smiled. Thank your friend, Mr. Rogozhin, for his kind thought, she says, then said her goodbyes and went out. Well, why didn't I just die on the spot? I mean, I only went because I thought I wouldn't come back alive. I felt the most annoying part was that beast Zalyozhev taking all the credit himself. I was dressed like a lackey, and I'm not very tall either. There I stood, speechless and shy, just staring at her, while he was dressed up to the nines, primped and pomaded, all pink in his check cravat, bowing and scraping, while she very likely took him for me. Well, I said as we left, just don't go getting any ideas in that quarter, understand? He laughs. And how exactly are you going to settle your account with Semyon Parfionich? To tell the truth, I was on the point of throwing myself in the water there and then, without going home. But I thought, what do I care, really? I returned to the house like a damned soul. Oh, oh dear. The official made a wry face as a shudder ran through him. You know, the deceased used to hound people to death for ten rubles, never mind ten thousand. He nodded to the prince, who in turn surveyed Rogozhin curiously. The latter seemed even paler at that moment. Hound to death, Rogozhin broke in. What do you know about it? He found out, he continued, addressing the prince. And in any case, Zalyozhev was blurting it out to everybody we met on the way. The old man got hold of me and locked me in upstairs, then laid into me for an hour. That's just a foretaste. I'll be back to bid you good night as well. And what do you think? The old chap went round to Nastasia Filipovna's, bowed to the ground, weeping and pleading with her. In the end, she brought the box out to him and snapped, There's your earrings then, old greybeard, and they're worth ten times more to me, now that I know the risk Parfion ran in getting them. Take my greetings to Parfion Simeonich and thank him. Meanwhile, I borrowed twenty rubles off Siryosha Protulshin with Mama's blessing and got the train to Pskov, where I arrived in a fever. The old women started reading the saints' days out over me with me sitting there drunk. Then I went the round of the tavern spending my last kopeck and lay about the streets all night dead to the world. By morning I was really ill and the dogs had been worrying at me in the night as well. I had a hard time coming, too. Never mind, sir, never mind. Nastasia Filipovna will sing a different tune now, tittered the official, rubbing his hands. What are earrings to us, sir? We'll make it up to her for those earrings. If you utter one more word about Nastasia Filipovna, then by the good Lord I'll thrash you, whether you went round with Likhachov or not. Rogozhin shouted, seizing him powerfully by the arm. If you do thrash me, it means you're not rejecting me. Go on. If you do, it seals. Ah, we've arrived. And indeed, they were pulling into the station. Although Rogozhin had said he'd gone off without telling anybody, several people were waiting for him. They were shouting and waving their caps in the air. Look at that. And Zalyozhev's here as well. Rogozhin muttered. His smile as he surveyed them was both triumphant and sardonic. He turned abruptly to the prince. 
I don't know why I've taken a fancy to you, Prince. Maybe it was just the time and place. But then I met him, too. He indicated Lebedev. And I certainly don't feel that way towards him. Come along to my house, Prince. We'll have those silly little gaiters off you, get you into a Martin coat, first class. You shall have a frock coat, first class, white waistcoat, whatever you want. I'll stuff your pockets full of money, and we'll go off to Nastasia Filipovna. Will you come or not? Listen to him, Prince Lev Nikolaevich, urged Lebedev with weighty solemnity. Don't miss the opportunity. Oh, don't miss it. Prince Mishkin half rose and politely extended a hand to Rogozhin, saying courteously, I shall come with the greatest of pleasure, and I am most grateful for your regard. I may come today even, if I am able to, because I tell you frankly, I'd taken a great liking to you, particularly when you were telling me the story of the diamond earrings, even before that, though you have such a gloomy face. I thank you also for the promised clothes and the overcoat, as I will certainly have need of them soon. As for money, I have hardly a penny to my name at the present moment. There'll be money by evening. Come along. There will. There will. Lebedev took it up. By evening and on until dawn there will. And are you a great admirer of the female sex, Prince? Tell me in advance. I? No. You see, I'm... perhaps you don't know, but because of the illness I was born with, I have no experience of women at all. Well, if that's so, Rogozhin exclaimed, you're an out-and-out -out holy fool, and God loves the likes of you. Such as these the Lord God loveth, echoed the official. And you follow me, pen-pusher, said Rogozhin to Lebedev as they all left the carriage. Lebedev had finished up by gaining his ends. Soon the noisy throng was moving off in the direction of Vaznesensky Prospect. The prince's route lay towards Litianeya. It was raw and dank. Inquiries from passers-by established that it was two miles or so to his destination, and he made up his mind to take a cab. Chapter 2 General Yapanchin resided in his own house just off Litianeya, towards the Church of the Transfiguration. Besides this splendid dwelling, five-sixths of which was rented out, the general possessed another huge house on Sadovaya, which also brought in a vast income. In addition to the two houses, he had an extensive and highly profitable estate outside the city. There was a factory of sorts, too in Petersburg province. It was common knowledge that many years before, General Yepanchin had been a tax farmer. Nowadays, his voice carried weight in a number of reputable business concerns. He passed for a man of considerable wealth with large responsibilities and influential contacts. In certain quarters, including his own department, he had been able to render himself absolutely indispensable. And yet it was also common knowledge that Ivan Fyodorovich Yepanchin was the uneducated son of a private soldier. Certainly this latter circumstance could only redound to his credit. But the general, intelligent man though he was, did have a number of minor, pardonable weaknesses, and disliked any hints in that direction. Nevertheless, he was intelligent and astute. That was undeniable. It was his way, for example, never to push himself forward where it was better to remain in the background, and many people valued him for this unassuming behavior, the fact that he always knew his place. If only those judges could have known what sometimes went on in the heart of that same Ivan Fyodorovich, who knew his place so well. Although he certainly possessed a good deal of practical experience in the day-to-day -day affairs, along with a number of remarkable abilities, he liked to convey the impression of being the executant of someone else's ideas rather than a man with a mind of his own, to play the loyalty without flattery role, even, such as the times we live in, the heartfelt Russian patriot. In this latter connection, he had gone so far as to get himself involved in a number of amusing incidents, but the general never repined, 
however amusing the situation. Besides, he was a lucky man, even at cards, and played for enormously high stakes. Far from wishing to conceal this supposed little weakness for the pasteboards, so materially useful to him on so many occasions, he actually flaunted it. He moved in mixed circles, but of course always among first-rate people. Everything lay ahead of him. There was no hurry, never any hurry. All would come to him in its own good time. After all, General Yepanchin was, as they say, in the very prime of his years, not a day over fifty-six. A flourishing age, certainly. An age when real life can truly be said to begin. His state of health, facial coloration, firm though blackened teeth, the stocky, thick-set build, the grave morning expression at work in the department, the genial one in the evening at cards or attending his highness, everything contributed to his present and future success and strewed his excellency's path with roses. The general was possessed of a flourishing family. True, not all was roses there, but there was a great deal else on which His Excellency had for long been seriously concentrating his fondest hopes and ambitions. Indeed, what ambitions in life are more important and sacrosanct than parental ones? What should one cleave to, if not to one's family? The General's family consisted of his wife and three grown-up daughters. He had got married long ago, when he was still an army lieutenant, to a girl of about his own age who possessed neither beauty nor education, and brought only fifty serfs with her, all told, though these had formed the basis of his later fortune. The general had never subsequently grumbled about his early marriage, never referred to it slightingly as a rash, youthful infatuation, and respected and occasionally feared his wife to the point of actual love. The general's wife was a princess Mishkina, of a very ancient, though hardly brilliant, lineage, and piqued herself greatly on her ancestry. A certain man of influence, one of those whose patronage costs them nothing, incidentally, agreed at that time to concern himself with the young princess's marriage. He opened doors for the young officer and pushed him through, though he didn't need pushing, even. A single glance would have been amply sufficient. Barring a few occasions, the pair had passed their long life together amicably. In her very early years, the general's wife, being a born princess and the last of her line, as well as through her own personal qualities, perhaps, had contrived to secure herself a number of patronesses in high places. Later on, through the wealth and official position of her husband, she began to feel somewhat at home in these exalted circles. In recent years, the general's daughters... Alexandra, Adelaida, and Aglaya had grown to maturity. True, all three were only Yepanchins, but they were descended from princes on their mother's side and had considerable dowries. Their father had prospects of achieving a very high position himself, and, what is also quite important, all three were remarkably pretty, including the eldest, Alexandra, who was already over twenty-five. The middle daughter was twenty-three, while the youngest, Aglaya, had just turned twenty. This youngest one was a great beauty, in fact, and beginning to attract considerable attention in society. Even this wasn't all. The three were remarkable for their cultivation, wit, and accomplishments. They were well known for the great affection they bore one another, and for standing by their sisters. There were even stories of the two elder girls making sacrifices for the sake of their youngest sister, the idol of the whole household. Rather than wanting to cut a figure in society, they were somewhat too modest and retiring. No one could accuse them of being haughty or supercilious, though people were aware that they had their pride and knew their own worth. The eldest was musical, and the middle one was a fine artist, but no one knew this for many years. It had only been discovered very recently, and that by chance. In a word, a very great deal was said in praise of them. Still, well-wishers were not universal. 
The number of books they read was commented on with horror. They were in no hurry to get married, and though they valued a certain circle of acquaintance, it was in a restrained fashion. This was all the more remarkable in the light of what was generally known of their father's character, desires, and ambitions. It was already nearly eleven o'clock when the prince rang the bell at the general's apartments. He lived on the first floor and occupied rooms on as modest a scale as possible, commensurate with his dignity. A liveried servant opened the door to the prince, and lengthy explanations followed, as at first the fellow looked suspiciously at him and at his bundle. Finally, after repeated and precise declarations that he really was Prince Mishkin and had urgent and immediate business with the general, the puzzled man conducted him into a small anteroom nearby, close to the study and leading into the actual reception room itself, before handing him on to another fellow whose morning duty it was to announce visitors to the general. This second man, who wore a tailcoat and a grave expression, was past forty. He was His Excellency's study attendant and announcer, and in consequence had a high opinion of himself. Wait in the reception room and leave your bundle here, he said, slowly and solemnly seating himself in his armchair. 